Hi, everyone. If you're watching me um, for our Google Plus Hangout, I will be getting started here in just a, a few moments. So hang tight, and uh, I'll be back shortly. All right, well, um, good evening, good night, uh, good morning, and uh, good day, I guess, to uh, anyone who happens to be out and, and watching. Uh, first of all, my name is Mike Fitz, and I'm a park ranger at Katmai National Park and Preserve, and I'm located on the Alaska Peninsula. I'm coming to you live from our headquarters in, uh, in King Salmon. And uh, during the uh, broadcast today, I will, uh, try to do my best to answer your questions you have about planning a trip to Brooks Camp. So I have a lot of, of things I wanna share with you. I have some photographs, I have some videos, some maps. I'll talk about a, a bunch of, well, different aspects about planning your trip. When to come, for instance, when you wanna to come to watch bears, what else can you do at Brooks Camp? So we're gonna to try to um, focus on a lot of different things um, over the next hour or so. If you uh, have questions for me about planning a trip to Brooks Camp, please uh, post those in the, the Q&A app if you're watching on Google+. I won't um, at this time be able to monitor any of the other um, places you might be watching this. So if you're watching on YouTube, for instance, I'm not gonna necessarily be able to see questions that you post there. Uh, but if you go to Google+, and you, and you find uh, the Hangout on Air, uh, you can post questions for me in the Q&A app, and I'll do my best to try to answer those for you. So, uh, Bear with me. I'm going to be sharing some screens here and there. There may be some technical snafus. There usually is with uh, with myself, so I'll be doing um, doing my best to uh, to get through those as, as quickly as I can. And I know at least a few of you are watching. Um, it looks like I have about 25 people right now, so that's just great. Uh, let's see here. What I wanted to start with, of course, is I wanted to share. Uh, a presentation or a little bit of a presentation with you and so I'm going to share my desktop here with everybody so just bear with me you might get a little bit of infinity here in just a moment so I'm going to sh um, 
put a few slides together because I want to uh, show everyone, give everyone a, a little bit of a taste of what it's like to really be at Brooks Camp. Uh, Brooks Camp is an amazing place. I love it there. I would live out there all year if the park let me, uh, but they tell me that I have to leave in the wintertime and come work in King Salmon. But it, it really is an amazing place. And it, sometimes things that I think are typical uh, for the rest of the world would be quite atypical, for instance. So I'm gonna share this video. And this is just something that happens uh, almost every day in the fall. Or in July, bears will just walk right by the Brooks Camp Visitor Center. And this is just a, a simple video that I ended up taking from the Visitor Center. Luckily the bear, um, which is number 32, he's nicknamed Chunk, just kept, kept walking right on by. But this is maybe one of those amazing experiences you can have if you have the opportunity to come and visit this place. I'm gonna skip ahead to the next slide. So that is just a little bit of a taste of Brooks Camp. But of course there's not just bears that happen here at Brooks Camp, although uh, bears are the main attraction. That's what most people come to the park uh, to see. Most people that visit Katmai National Park and Preserve, they're coming to Bear Watch. Most people that come to Brooks Camp especially are coming to Bear Watch too. So overall, or over the course of the season, we'll probably get uh, eight to 10,000 people that come to visit and the majority of those people are coming specifically to watch bears and maybe partake in some of the other things that makes Brooks Camp such a, such a special place. So today, again, we're gonna talk about bear watching. We're gonna talk about when you should come, what places you can go along the river. We'll uh, talk a little bit about, about uh, the facilities in the campground, maybe a little bit about what you can bring in the campground or should bring to, um, to stay in the campground. Some of the special considerations uh, associated with the campground, because it, it is kind of a unique one compared to what you're gonna find in, in most of uh, the lower 48 states. We'll uh, talk on, or touch on uh, Brooks Lodge and talk about a little bit of the accommodations that they have uh, for people and some of the services they offer um, to the general public, just not people staying in the lodge, but uh, people that are coming from all over the place to just for the day, they offer services for um, day trippers and campers as well. And we'll, we'll talk about some of the other things uh, that you can do at Brooks Camp as well, because it's worth some time maybe to try to experience uh, other places uh, in and around Brooks Camp. So we'll talk about some of the other activities. We'll talk about, I think, uh, maybe some, some other considerations, important considerations that you should keep in mind before you happen to come and visit. And I'll try to give you some of my, um, my uh, best advice on what you should bring before you happen to arrive and what you should expect when you do arrive. Now, before we uh, go any further, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a um, geographic um, perspective on Katmai. So uh, I'm gonna minimize uh, the presentation here in just a moment. So and then I'm gonna share this Google Earth screen with you. Uh, because Alaska is kind of a, a long way away from, well, anywhere except uh, the North Pole and the Yukon Territory. So it, it takes quite a bit of an effort to, to get to Alaska and especially Katmai. You are flying to uh, Katmai. Most people happen to go through Anchorage. You don't necessarily have to go through Anchorage, uh, but most people are gonna go there. Uh, they're gonna stop in Anchorage, for, for instance, and uh, from there, they're gonna jump on a plane and they're gonna go to King Salmon. And then from there, they're gonna to try to take a little, uh, a little, or a smaller plane from, from King Salmon into the middle of Brooks Camp, or into the middle of Katmai at Brooks Camp. And Katmai National Park and Preserve is located at the head of the Alaska Peninsula. So we are actually fairly far west. Uh, just to give you a perspective on how far west we are, I'll zoom in just a little bit here. Anchorage, Alaska is over here, and the map isn't quite oriented to the north anymore. So let me rotate that just a little bit. So Anchorage is way up here where uh, my hand is, the mouse pointer. We're located about 300 miles uh, southwest of Anchorage. So that's uh, where you can find Katmai, and Katmai is a very large area. Uh, it's about 4.1 million acres, and I apologize for anybody who's watching who's um, not in the United States. I don't know what that is in hectares. It's, it's you know, you can at least have that that number for hectares. Uh, 
but it's, it's a fairly large place. It takes a, a bit of an effort to get to. So people are going to fly from Anchorage to King Salmon, which is right around in this area. And then they're uh, going to take a smaller plane typically to Brooks Camp. There are, are however, services offered from um, Kodiak Island. There are services offered from uh, Homer, Alaska, and other places in the Kenai Peninsula, too, that can fly you directly to Brooks Camp. But Brooks Camp is pretty far west. Uh, and a lot of people don't realize that. I didn't really realize that either. Some, sometimes people in my family still can't wrap their head around this. But you know, when I talk about where the Pacific Ocean is, the Pacific Ocean is east of where I am right now. So when, when I want to go see the ocean, uh, I can go west, I can go to the Bering Sea, and I can go to Bristol Bay. But if I want to see the Pacific, I have to go uh, due east. So we're really far west. And just to show you how far west we actually are, um, if I were to get the location info for my place mark for Brooks Camp here, and we just look at the longitude, so the measure of how far east or west we are, um, rem try to remember that number. So that's uh, 155 degrees, 46 minutes, 48.23 seconds. So I, I had another bit of uh, another place mark on my Google Earth map here, just to share that with you. Because if you were to head due south, and I do mean due south, you put, you took a compass and you adjusted for your magnetic declination and you went due south, the next bit of land that you would actually reach would be the big island of Hawaii. So if I were to get the location info for this place, Mark, you can see that the, the longitude is extremely close to what I had for Brooks Camp. So really within a few miles, I could get uh, due south. I could get to uh, Mauna Loa, Hawaii. So we're, we're pretty far west. And that makes, um, you know, traveling out here just a little, uh, takes just a little bit longer to get here than, than most other places. So again, looking at the globe, Maybe a little bit hard to see, but um, again, we're much further north, obviously, than Hawaii. We don't have a tropical climate, but we are um, directly north of the Hawaiian Islands, the big island of Hawaii. So that gives you a bit of a, a perspective on the globe of where we, where we are. Uh, I have a, another map here that I want to show you, and that's the park map for Katmai. To give you a bit of a perspective on where Brooks Camp is within the park and preserve itself. So I mentioned before, most people are gonna fly from Anchorage to King Salmon. They're gonna do that typically on, on two airlines, either Alaska Air or Peninsula Airways, which is um, often called Pen Air, uh, on, the, on those, their services, their commercial services. And then typically from Brooks Camp, or excuse me, from King Salmon, you have to fly to Brooks Camp because there's no road access to Brooks Camp. Most people are gonna do that on uh, Katmai Air, which is uh, the park's official concessioner. And the advantage of flying with Katmai Air is that they offer seat fares. Uh, with other um, commercial services, you're probably going to have to charter the whole plane. But Katmai Air offers seat fares to and from Brooks Camp for day trips or for more extended periods of time. And it's a quick flight, maybe about 25 minutes or so to Brooks Camp uh, from, from, from King Salmon. But Brooks Camp is located uh, more towards the center of Katmai National Park. And there was one other map I wanted to show you, and that's the actual Brooks Camp map itself. So we're going to talk about the different areas uh, that you find uh, on the map here, which places are good to see bears, which ones you should avoid at certain times of the year, things, things of that nature. So we'll go back to this map um, several times. So let me uh, get back to my uh, keynote presentation here. And probably get to some of, one of the more burning questions on people's minds, and that is when and where can you view bears at Brooks Camp? Again, this is what most people come to Brooks Camp for. It's a really exciting experience. Uh, I never really get tired of watching bears at, at Brooks Camp. I feel very fortunate that I live there during the summer, and I get this opportunity to know the bears really well. But it's, it's worth the time uh, to come and, and try to do this if you can. So we're going to talk about the different places at Brooks Camp where you can have these wildlife viewing opportunities. 
Now, to be honest with you, there's, there's no bear-free area at Brooks Camp. So anywhere that you happen to be, you can experience bears. The only place that you may not find bears is on the viewing platforms with you or inside of buildings. But other than that, anywhere that you happen to be, you can definitely find bears. Then the places where it's probably easiest to watch bears um, and maybe safest to do so happens to be on the viewing platforms that we have. So we have three of those along the Brooks River. We have the Falls platform, the Riffles platform, and the Lower River platform. And I'll talk about each one of those, the advantages of those, uh, what you can happen to see at those places, and what time of the year can you go to those places and uh, expect to find bears? Because you can't go to all those places at all times during the summer and expect to see bears. But I think we probably should start with, um, with the Falls platform. Because that's you know, kind of the, one of the iconic scenes of national parks uh, in the United States is the, the scene of bears catching fish at Brooks Falls. And I've seen as many, as many as uh, I think 22 bears within my line of sight, and I wasn't counting cubs uh, in, that, in that number. So from the falls platform, I've seen at least 22 bears So if you're coming here in July, that's definitely the place to go. Brooks Falls is not necessarily the go-to destination in other months during the summertime, though. So if you were to come in early June, for instance, or you were to come to come in August or September, you're probably not going to see many, if any, bears fishing at Brooks Falls. Brooks Falls uh, attracts bears uh, from very late June, the last few days of June, until the end of July, sometimes very early August. But by the, uh, by the end of July, the, the activity with bears uh, fishing for salmon at Brooks Falls has really dropped off um, pretty dramatically. So the, the, the peak of, of bears fishing at Brooks Falls, peak numbers definitely is the, the middle of July. And of course, that's where people want to go. They want to go and they want to try to uh, get that photo, that iconic photo of a bear catching a fish in its mouth. So sometimes it could be... It, could take a little bit of patience uh, to get that that shot. Um, I've never really been able to capture it all that well, but you can you can do it if you if you go to Brooks Falls at the right time of the year. But sometimes you can go there at the right time of the year, and and perhaps you're not going to get that shot. I mean, it, it is really amazing to see the fish jumping, but bears don't always fish the lip of the falls. the The lip of the falls um, in the last photo where this bear is standing, that's not the most preferred fishing spot for a lot of bears. So many bears will fish there, but not all of them will. Uh, and many bears will just ignore that spot because there's better fishing opportunities below the falls. But when the salmon are jumping, it really is an amazing, um, an amazing scene. When I play this video for you, I mean, you, over the, the course of this, this moment, there are hundreds of fish are jumping out of the water. Uh, so this was, to, to see this phenomenon, to see the salmon run into, um, into the river, and to see the abundance of Katmai in the summertime is, is really quite amazing. But when you see this many fish in the water, to be honest with you, you're probably going to see less bears fishing at Brooks Falls because they, well, they, they get full. And I'll show you uh, this video here. Uh, this is one of the big adult males that likes to fish up at Brooks Falls. And I took this video just a couple years ago and just with my point and shoot camera too. So you don't need fancy equipment to really um, to get – uh, nice footage and nice photographs of the bears at Brooks Falls. But this, I, I took this video on a day where uh, this bear was catching a lot of fish and there was a lot of fish in the water. When the bears are really hungry, they're going to eat those fish in less than a minute. I've timed some bears and they'll eat a whole four to six pound sockeye salmon in less than a minute. But th this bear had caught dozens of fish earlier in the day. It was pretty full by that time. So it really only decided to eat, eat the brain. But, you know, a, just a moment later, it was right back for more. So if you're going to Brooks Falls um, and there's salmon carcasses all over the place, you're probably likely to see less bears just because they happen to get full and they happen to sleep it off. So there's variability in the number of bears that you're going to see at Brooks Falls. And that, you know, that's kind of just a matter of chance. The salmon don't move into the river in consistent numbers. Uh, so we don't see huge numbers of fish all the time, every day. Some days uh, you might go up to Brooks Falls and you can see 
you know, dozens of fish jumping a minute, hundreds of fish jumping a minute. And then you can come back a few hours later and there's almost no fish there because that wave of salmon has sort of pushed on through. But when there's less fish in the water in the middle of July, especially, that's usually when you're going to find more bears. And when you're on the wildlife viewing platform, you're just 10 feet above those bears and they do walk all around the platform. They walk behind you. So keep your head on a swivel. Uh, don't just focus on the bears that are on top of the falls. Look around because you'll see a lot of interesting behavior. You'll see a lot of different activity, a lot of different bears doing many different things. So that's a little bit about the falls platform. And that's definitely the place to go in July. Um, uh, the platform, wildlife viewing platform up at Brooks Falls is a, a, a really a July destination. What, uh, another place to go that's also a July destination happens to be the Riffles platform. And that's just downstream of Brooks Falls. It's part of the same uh, boardwalk complex. So if you're taking the, the trail to Brooks Falls, right before you get to Brooks Falls, you'll, uh, you'll climb on or walk onto a boardwalk. And from there, you can go to the falls or to the Riffles. And the Riffles is kind of a neglected spot because it's not as close to the falls as the other platform but it's worth spending some time at. It's a really pretty place, but you get to see different bears doing different things down there than you would at Brooks Falls. A lot of times younger bears, uh, bears that are called subadults, which are the young bears between two and a half years old and five years old, they will uh, fish there, they'll sit on rocks, they'll be looking for uh, salmon to swim by. You oftentimes will see families with cubs down there as well too. And then it, as the season progresses, the Riffles platform is a really great place to look for salmon spawning. Uh, and you can sometimes track the individual behavior of certain salmon down below because they will fight with one another for nesting spots. Males will fight with other males for access to females. And females will fight with females to gain access um, to the best nesting spots. So it's, it's um, the... The Riffles platform is a great place to see different bears doing different things. And later in the season, it's a great place to watch for salmon too. Now, before I, I go any further and um, talk about the lower river platform, again, if you have questions specifically about bear watching, post them in the uh, using the Q&A app uh, on the, the Google Plus uh, screen. And I'll, I'll try to get those. I, I see a couple questions are in there right now. Um, and one's about camping and one's about backpacking and, and, and backcountry opportunities. So I'll do my best to try to get to those a little bit later on um, once we get to those those topics because I was kind of planning on on uh, uncovering those. So if you have other questions about bear watching or anything that comes to mind, please um, put those in, into the Q&A app and I'll do my best to try to answer those. Probably the, the next and, and final place uh, to watch bears at, at Brooks Camp happens to be the lower river platform. And this is one of my favorite spots. Uh, I love the falls, I love the riffles, and I, I love the lower river platform just as much. There's so much that goes on down here. You have a, a really wide variety of habitats. Uh, you get to see bears, you get to see uh, salmon, you of course get to see a lot of different birds. Uh, sometimes, you know, you, moose can be seen down there on rare occasions, wolves have been seen down there on rare occasions. So this is a really fantastic spot. And just like the falls and riffles platforms, you're on an elevated viewing structure and you get to watch the bears as they uh, do their business uh, right down below you. And again, you are really right on top of the bears. All these wildlife viewing platforms give the bears the opportunity to walk right next to you, right underneath you. And it's important for us to consolidate in these uh, in these places, even though, you know, sometimes it can look a little crowded and certainly it can get crowded, but it's important for us to consolidate ourselves in these places because when that happens, bears, they, they happen to, to learn that when we behave in a predictable manner, then they can behave in a predictable manner around us. So when we're on these elevated viewing structures, the bears are much more likely to go about their business. The lower river is also really cool, not because just because the bears can be close to you. Oftentimes the bears aren't. Maybe they're at a, a greater distance away. But the, the activity there really changes throughout the season. Unlike Brooks Falls, where if bears are fishing there in September, which they might do, they're fishing at Brooks Falls in July and September, they're probably going to be using a lot of the same fishing techniques. At the lower river, however, when the salmon first arrive, a lot of the bears that are fishing down there are going to be chasing fish. They're going to be working really hard to try to capture those fish. Later in the season, though, uh, 
or excuse me, before I, I get to that, um, it's it's also a really good place um, to watch and look for females with cubs. And in many cases, uh, females with cubs will avoid Brooks Falls. Not all cases, some females will take their cubs up to Brooks Falls, but some won't. They just say, hey, there's too many other bears up there, too many big males, and I want to avoid that area uh, altogether. So they'll take their chances fishing in a place where they have maybe less success, uh, but less opportunities to run into um, uh, a lot of other bears. So go to the lower river to see um, bears chasing fish through the water early in the season. Go to the lower river to see those um, those first year cubs with their mothers. Also go to the lower river in September, especially to look for bears snorkeling for fish. September's kind of a different ball game at Brooks Camp. Uh, you really don't have many bears fishing uh, for salmon up at Brooks Falls, although occasionally there can be some, like I mentioned before. Really what the bears are doing in September is they're focused on the lower half of the Brooks River. And they're gonna be snorkeling for salmon, Look, basically looking for anything that can't just uh, swim away from them. That time of the year, the salmon are spawning and they're dying. And as they, their carcasses drift downstream, they collect in all the eddies and side channels and slow moving portions of the Brooks River. And the bears know that there's easy meals in those places. So they're just cruising up and down the river like battleships, looking for, look at it for those dead and dying. Sometimes they'll bring those fish right over to you. And they'll eat it right underneath the platform itself. In the fall, this is a great place to, um, the lower platform again, is a great place to see Females with cubs, it's a, a fantastic place just to see fat, fluffy bears. They, in July, the bears are shedding their coats. They can often look really ragged. They can be covered in scars, especially the adult males. But in the fall, the bears are, are much, um, much fatter. Their scarring really doesn't happen to show very much. Um, they have nice new fur coats in. Uh, they don't happen to move uh, maybe as much as they um, in July. So you can sometimes experience delays going where do you want to go because there's so many bears in the way in September. But in uh, September, the destination at Brooks Camp is certainly uh, the lower river platform. And when there aren't bears around, or even when there are bears around, the lower river platform is a fantastic place, again, to look for fish, look for salmon in the water. So um, before I uh, get to uh, a question um, about, um, about bear watching that I see uh, um, in the Q&A, just to recap, um, I'll show you just a little bit of our, our bear viewing calendar here. So if you were to come to June uh, or in Brooks Camp and you wanted to see bears in June, you really have to come the last few days uh, of June. You, we can see bears throughout the month of June. Sometimes we do see bears every day, but maybe like on June 1st, for instance, or June 2nd, we see a bear for 15 minutes as it just waltzes through. Uh, the middle of June, kind of the same thing. There's a lot of days, most of the days during the month of June, probably where uh, bears are infrequent visitors, and when they're around, they're not around for, for very long at all. So if you're coming to watch bears um, in June, try to make it the last few days. Last few days of June are going to be a better bet than earlier in the month. I actually like the last few days of June. You don't really have a lot of bears fishing at Brooks Falls. We're not at peak bear time yet. But the bears that get there at that during the last few days of June are really hungry. They haven't had any salmon since <laughs> since last October. So they're, they're looking for a meal. And you can almost see like a look of satisfaction on their face when uh, they happen to catch that first salmon dinner. So last few days of June, you can... Uh, are, are pretty good for, for viewing uh, bears. The Earlier in the month, maybe not so much. If you wanted to see um, bears in July, these different um, viewing platforms, you know, Brooks Falls is, is where it's at in July. The Riffles platform is really fantastic as well. And so is the Lower River platform too. Uh, definitely if you wanted to, to catch uh, a photo of a bear catching a fish in its mouth, Try to time your visit for um, the first uh, two weeks of, of, of July. Later in July, you're going to see bears fishing at Brooks Falls, but the salmon uh, run really peaks in the beginning of July, and the bear numbers peak by the middle of July. Their numbers kind of lag behind the peak of the salmon. By the end of July, we're not really seeing a lot of salmon pushing into the Brooks River and trying to go beyond Brooks Falls. So if you're looking for that iconic shot of bears 
um, catching a fish in their mouth uh, on top of Brooks Falls, try to time your visit for the first couple of weeks of July. But if you're not really concerned with getting that shot, then throughout the, the whole entire month, you're probably going to see bears um, fishing at, at Brooks Falls. And at the lower river, definitely you can, um, it may take a little bit more patience in July, but you can see a lot of bears fishing there as well too. August at Brooks Camp, to be honest with you, not a good month. Um, like the first three weeks of June, um, August is kind of a, a poor time to visit. There will be bears around. There will be bears wandering on through. But August is when the salmon become available in a lot of different streams throughout the Katmai region. So you'll have salmon in many small streams where and, and bears can just walk all over the park and find and find food. So they don't necessarily need to concentrate at Brooks Falls. And that's why most of the bears, if not all of them, dispersed throughout the month of August. And last year, during the middle of August, we probably went about 10 days or so without seeing a bear. So you can find bears usually at the beginning of August and at the very end of August, but typically not in the middle of August. So if you're coming in August, try to time it for the extreme ends of that month. Try it for the, the first few days. There may be some bears around there, maybe not in the last few days. Same thing, maybe a few bears around. But, but but maybe not. So August is typically not a, a great time to come. And then September at Brooks Falls, uh, we can have bears fishing there. Not often though. They're mostly going to be concentrated in different areas of the river. The lower river is definitely where it's at in September. So big, you want to see big fat bears uh, come to come to Brooks Camp in September and you'll see plenty of them, especially uh, near the mouth of the Brooks River itself. So that's just a little bit about uh, bear watching. Um, there's, uh, before I get to the a question about, uh, bear, about bear watching here, uh, one thing that I wanted to show you, I, I wanted to invite everyone to sort of begin their bear watching experience even before they come to Brooks Camp. So if you go to Katmai's website, if you were to happen to go to, um, N, and it's uh, nps.gov slash katm, on our website, if you go to photos and multimedia, you can find our ebook section. And there you can download uh, identification guides to the Brooks River Bears. We have one that's in, in PDF format. We also have one that's uh, that you can use uh, on uh, Mac or Macintosh or Apple operating systems. So you can download that from iTunes. So that's an iBooks version. It's a little bit more interactive than the PDF version, but the PDF has the advantage that you can you can read it on any any uh, platform, Windows, uh, Apple systems. It doesn't matter. Uh, and I'll be working on updating these this winter. You might you can down. You're welcome to download them now. We'd love you to, to download them now. But we'll be updating those um, and uploading new versions for you uh, to download uh, later this winter. So I'm working on that right now. But that ha happens to highlight a lot of the, um, the different individual bears that you can see along the river, too. We have a couple other ebooks as well about the cultural history of the area, too. And that can be very interesting um, reads before you happen to arrive at Brooks Camp as well. So download those ebooks if you want to. One other thing that I would like everyone to do, of course, before you happen to arrive is to watch our webcams. If you're not familiar with them, we have several streaming webcams along the Brooks River. And you can watch those uh, on. Uh, explore.org or you can watch them directly on on Katmai's website when they happen to be visible so if you wanted to know what the activity was like at Brooks Falls the day before you happen to arrive check out the Brooks Falls cam you want to see what's happening at the lower river or the riffles check out those cameras so in this way you can really extend your experience to before you happen to arrive and even after you happen to arrive too especially through our webcams and you'll find rangers like myself um, on the webcams quite frequently talking with you uh, about bears. So if you're not familiar with our webcams, please go uh, to explore.org and we'll just check out the lower river cam right now. And it actually, it, it's gonna be off at this time of the year or this time of the day, cause it's dark right now. But you can go there and um, and definitely check out those those cams any anytime that, that you want to. So. We, we certainly invite you to extend your experience beyond when you're physically at Brooks Camp itself. Okay, so um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here for just a moment and get back on camera here so you can see see my ugly mug. But we got a, a, a few questions in our in our app here, um, in the Q&A app. And again, 
if you want, if you want to ask me direct questions, maybe that I'm not covering, you need more information about something, please feel free to post your questions. So about bear watching, um, uh, atypical here, uh, she says, or she asks, or he asks, um, are there any, any time limits for watching bears on the viewing platforms? Are there hours where you can go and when, and when you can't go? So I'm gonna um, answer that question right now. When can you go to the, to the wildlife viewing platforms? And that kind of depends on um, which platform you're talking about and the time of the year. Uh, so let me uh, show you the Brooks Camp map real quick here. So I'm going to have to share that my screen once again. So hang on a second. All right. I'm going to share the Brooks Camp map with everybody. Because the only platform that has uh, restrictions on its hours happens to be the one at Brooks Falls. So at Brooks Falls, uh, from June 15th uh, until August 15th currently, uh, you cannot be at the falls platform between the hours of 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. And the reason for this is because there's a lot of bears that just don't tolerate the, the presence of people. So we want to give those bears the opportunity to fish at Brooks Falls with really without our prying eyes. Uh, so between the hours of, of 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. from June 15th to August 15th, you uh, can't be on the falls platform. So it's closed to people. It's even close to myself. I just can't go up there even as a ranger uh, and, and watch bears uh, at Brooks Falls unless I, was, um, I had a, a special uh, study that I, was, that I was doing. So our biologists occasionally will go up there during their, um, during their study sessions to monitor bears at Brooks Falls, but um, it's it's off limits to the public during that time. Again, to allow those bears that aren't uh, tolerant of the presence of people a chance to fish without our disturbance. And that goes for the Riffles platform as well. So really it's the whole boardwalk complex up at Brooks Falls that closes during that time period. The other um, platform that down at the lower river has no um, restrictions on the, the time of the year or the amount of time that you can be on uh, on there. The Riffles platform doesn't have any restrictions on the amount of time you can be on it, but the falls does. And so that's kind of like the other, uh, the other I think, um, important thing to consider when you're going to Brooks Falls, for instance, during um, the month of July, it can get really, really crowded. Uh, we can have sometimes 200 people, 300 people per day at Brooks Camp, and they all want to go to Brooks Falls in July to see the bears um, that happen to be fishing there. So the falls platform was designed to only hold 40 people. So that's its maximum capacity. And um, we limit the number of people that can go on to the falls platform itself. And it really gets crowded during the middle of the day. So if you have the opportunity to stay overnight, if you're at the lodge and you're staying overnight or in the campground, you might want to try to to go to Brooks Falls earlier in the morning or um, later in the evening after a lot of the people that are coming for the day after they've already left because it tends to be less crowded in the morning and in the evening. It's really from about 9 a.m. until probably 3 p.m. or so when Brooks Falls does seem very, very crowded. And we have usually 40 people max um, during that, that whole entire time. Now, what we do to, to manage the, um, the crowding issues at Brooks Falls, and it's not a perfect solution, but it allows us to give everyone at least some access to Brooks Falls. And that happens to be limiting people's time when there's a waiting list. So the way it works is uh, when, when there's 40 people on, on the falls platform, everyone who's out there is limited to one hour at a time when people are waiting. So there's 40 people on the platform and there's 10 people that are waiting. We limit everyone who's out on the falls platform to just one hour and we keep a wait list just like you would at a restaurant for how many people wanna, wanna go out to the, um, to the falls platform and watch bears. So after um, you're out there for an hour, we um, ask that you yield your spot, and then that allows us to rotate some, some new people in to give them access to Brooks Falls. You're not limited to an hour a day. You're just limited to an hour at a time, and only uh, when people are waiting. So if no one's waiting, you can stay out there for five hours. And a lot of times, that's what I do in the evening, to be honest with you. I mean, sometimes I've gone up to Brooks Falls um, in the middle of July at 5 p.m., 
And I haven't left until 10 p.m. when I'm required by law to, to, to do so. Uh, so if no one's waiting, you can spend as much time up there as you want to. But when we were at capacity and there, we do have a wait list running, um, we, we need everyone to just yield their spot after an hour just so we can give everyone at least some access to Brooks Falls. So that's an important consideration if you're coming for just the day. Uh, you will experience probably some crowding issues at Brooks Falls if you're coming in the middle of any time in July especially. So anytime in July you're coming for the day, you probably are going to experience some crowding issues at Brooks Falls. So just be a little bit patient. You can watch bears at the Riffles in the meantime, and we'll do our best to try to get you up to Brooks Falls um, and onto that platform as soon as space is available. So I'm going to browse the, the questions here and see if there's any other questions about bear viewing. Um, I see a, a couple about camping and um, backcountry opportunities. Uh, since we're kind, I'm, I'm going to get to um, Kat. I'm going to get to your question a little bit later on. So I, I was going to uh, kind of answer that a little bit later on. Is a mosquito uh, head net necessary? I probably uh, probably say yes. Yeah, if you're going to if you're going to come to Brooks Camp, definitely a head net. I think is one of those things that you should bring along with you. It doesn't matter the season. If it's June, July, August, or September, I probably would bring along. A long one because um, it's just not mosquitoes um, in June we, it could be mosquitoes but in July it could, it could be black flies or the black flies might come out a little bit early uh, in August and September it might not be mosquitoes or black flies it could be no seams so we have a plethora of biting insects for your uh, for your enjoyment when you happen to come here so I definitely would bring a head net that's certainly one of those items that um, I would not come to Alaska without and I, I don't see any other questions at this time about um, bear watching. So uh, that's okay. If you have more, they happen to come up a little bit later. Please uh, post them, and I'll do my best to try to answer those. In the meantime, I'd like to get to um, some um, information about lodging and camping. I think that was the next thing that I had in my presentation here. So I'll go back to my keynote presentation. Uh, so bear with me for just a moment here while I bring that up. Here we are. Oops. Okay. <clears throat> and I'm going to share my screen with you. So I forgot to do that. Okay, we're back to infinity for just a moment. Okay, so we covered when to um, when to view bears. I try to book, talk about. Um, camping and lodging next. Uh, the campground, uh, we'll talk about that before we get to Brooks Lodge. The campground is kind of a really unique um, campground compared to what you find at the lower 48. It's located right, in the, right on the shore of Naknek Lake. It's a beautiful place, beautiful setting, but it's surrounded by an electric fence. <laughs> it's, you know, you're, you're camping in a place with extremely high densities of bears. Uh, the, before the fence was put in in the 1990s, Bears would wander through the campground often, on a daily basis. Um, there would be uh, bears wandering through the campground next to people's tents. You can imagine that made people nervous. <laughs> so the, in the 1990s, um, and I don't know the exact year, but an electric fence was put up around the campground. The fence is, uh, is of course, is bear resistant. It's not bear proof. Bears can easily get through the fence if they want to. But uh, if, if bears don't have a strong motivation to go through the fence, then they're, then they're really not going to do it. The, over the, I think the past several years, the only instances we've had of bears going through the fence was when a bear happened to be chased by another bear through the through the fence itself. So, uh, campers have been doing a really great job of making sure that bears don't have any temptations to go through the fence and into the campground. Uh, but that's one of the unique things about the campground itself. There are no designated sites within the electric fence. You can kind of pitch your tent wherever there happens to be um, a suitable spot. And in the campground itself, the facilities that we have um, are not like this anymore. Uh, a few years ago, uh, you, well, let's say, uh, you know, back in the, in the 70s and 80s, you would have had to put your food up in a cache, an elevated cache in the campground. So we don't make you climb this ladder anymore. We do have cooking shelters for people, though, uh, and, and we have uh, food and gear caches as well. As well. So on, on the left side of this photograph, that's one of the designated um, cooking and eating shelters. You're going to want to prepare and cook your food only in those places to reduce um, and concentrate food odors in only those spots. 
And then you want, you, you need to store your food properly in the food and gear cache. And that's what you're the building that you're seeing on the right hand side. So the, again, the facilities at the campground are communal. Um, the, the food cache, you kind of just store your food in a bin that you um, happen to find an empty spot for. Gear cache is the same. Uh, this is for extra stuff that you don't want to necessarily keep in your tent. Uh, theft at Brooks Camp is really rare. We've, I think we've had a, a couple people say that maybe they had something stolen. So if you had something really valuable, you don't want to stick it in the gear cache. You're going to want to keep that with you. Obviously, don't put your wallet in the, in the gear cache. But other things, you know, like backpacks, extra clothes, um, stuff like that that you're not using, um, you can store those in the gear cache as well in the campground. And I think that's a good idea too. You're, you're welcome to store your um, stuff in your tent as well. But let's say, for instance, a bear gets into the campground. And it decides to investigate your tent when no one's around and it's raining or something like that. If the bear pokes a hole in your tent, um, tears up your sleeping bag, you're probably going to want some dry clothing. So oftentimes it can be nice to keep a dry um, set of clothes in the, uh, in, in, in the gear cache itself. And of course, there's um, drinking water down there. Um, you can clean your dishes where you can um, get your potable water. And we have vault toilets as well, too. Now, to make campground reservations, you're going to want to go to uh, recreation.gov. And there's a couple of uh, nuances to this site that I want to go over with people really quickly. Uh, you can't make reservations for the campground yet. That starts January 5th at 8 a.m. Alaska time, 12 noon Eastern time. But you can get yourself set up for making campground reservations because if you want to come in July, the demand for the campground is really high. Most days in July, the campground is booked solid. So you're going to want to try to make a reservation as early as you can. You know that you want to come in the middle of July, for instance. Try to get on here at uh, 8 a.m. Alaska time on, on January 5th and make a campground reservation itself. Um, but be careful um, how you search for uh, for Katmai on, um, on recreation.gov because you can sometimes bring up different places that aren't necessarily going to – give you campground reservations for the right spot. So you can type in Brooks and you'll find all these other hits. Wait for that to populate and you're gonna wanna um, pick Katmai National Park and Preserve, um, Brooks Camp and Fury's Cabin Permits. You can also um, type in Kat, oops, Katmai and wait for it to populate and then make sure that you're not picking Katmai Wilderness or Katmai National Park. Make sure you're picking the one that allows you to select the permits. And then search for that. Um, it's right now. It's not going to let me check um, or make it go through the motions really to um, make a campground reservation because the reservation period, of course, is not open. Uh, but check availability. Uh, one little thing on here, though, uh, that's sometimes difficult um, to to see or notice happens to be this find permits drop down box right here. So you're going to want to select that. Select overnight. Entrance type, um, if you're staying in the campground, you're going to pick a, the campground, Brooks Camp. And again, you can pick you know, what day you want, your group size, your length of stay, and hit search. Now, to allow you to make campground reservations, you're going to have to log in. So if you haven't used recreation.gov before, then uh, sign in or, or sign up for an account. And that way, you can be logged in on January 5th, and you'll be ready to go. So pay attention to those little bits of things uh, before um, January 5th if you're dead set on camping in July. In September, we don't really have a, a super high demand for, for the campground. Usually, there's at least a dozen spots open per day uh, in the campground in, in September. Oh, and one more thing that I should mention, too, is that um, – the campground itself only accommodates 60 people, so we don't have designated sites. We just have uh, just have um, a, a maximum capacity based on people. So uh, 60 people um, maximum is what, what the campground can actually hold. So let's see here. Uh, 
Another question about the campground. Before I get to the lodge, I see there's maybe a question about the lodge, and I'll try to um, get to that in just a moment here. But if you're camping, uh, one question uh, in the app here is, is there a, a communal fire pit? Can you have individual fires? Oh, you know, where do you happen to get firewood? So there are three designated fire rings in the campground, and they are communal, so you have to share them with other people that want to um, waltz up and enjoy the warmth of the campfire with you. Uh, you can collect and use dead and down wood for your campfires, but you can't you know, um, push over a standing dead tree um, or any, any live trees. So dead and down wood only is what you can collect. And usually there's enough wood that's in the forest or, or um, down along the edge of the beach um, that you can, you can uh, find uh, firewood pretty easily. So that's where you get your firewood, dead and down wood only, and there are three communal fire pits in the campground. Okay, and uh, what about uh, foods for campers to bring? Is milk available for purchase? Is, are there um, places for campers to, to store perishable foods? So let's see, I don't know if I can answer the first part of that question. What would campers bring? It, it really just depends on what you like to eat, obviously. Um, and it, maybe that's kind of a, um, a, bad, a bad answer um, to the question, but I when I go camping, I. I like to eat really simple things, um, bean burritos, for instance. Sometimes I don't even cook uh, when I'm backpacking. I might just bring uh, some some refried beans with me, some cheese, and some tortillas, and that's that happens to be my dinner. Cold cereal for breakfast. Uh, it, I would I would recommend though bringing things that are simple simple to cook. Uh, that it's probably going to be the easiest way to go about it, I guess. Uh, it's, it's, it's really hard to say. I don't know how much time you're really going to want to spend cooking uh, uh, versus how much time you want to be out doing other things. I, I would recommend bringing high calorie foods, uh, things that are really good for you and bringing snacks as well. Uh, so there's, or it's probably what I would recommend things that are easy to prepare, things that certainly you, you like to eat and certainly are high calorie. We don't at Brooks Lodge does sell some food. Um, but they don't sell uh, milk, I believe. You can buy a soda pop there, you can buy some bottled water, um, but I don't believe they, they sell milk. Uh, you can purchase some in King Salmon though, so if you wanted to purchase it in King Salmon, you can do so. Uh, but to tell you the truth, it's, it's really, really expensive here. It happens to run uh, in King Salmon sometimes over $10 a gallon. So you really have to want fresh milk if you want that um, at, at Brooks Camp. Uh, I, I would, Maybe recommend though, probably buying uh, uh, some of the boxed milk that you can find. Um, some you can find it in King Salmon um, at the at the grocery store. There, it's um, ultra pasteurized. It's non -per or it's shelf stable. It's perishable, but not really until you open it up. Um, so you can buy that boxed milk, and you can bring that out with you. And within my experience, uh, it that stuff doesn't spoil very quickly at all. So uh, especially it, it, it tends to be kind of cool at Brooks Camp. I don't think you'd have to worry about that type of milk spoiling if you really wanted it. Uh, and we don't have places for campers to store perishable um, items. So you just have to um, hope that your stuff doesn't spoil if you happen to bring it along or uh, just, you know, um, take take your chances, I, I think. Cheese does does pretty well. It's usually not that hot. So if you wanted to bring cheese along, I think you'd be um, A-OK -okay with that. All right, and uh, I think that's the only question about camping that I see right now. So uh, a few other um, random questions that I'll try to try to get to before I happen to move on, and we'll talk about lodging at the campground next. Uh, are you required to have a uh, Are you required to have a fishing license if you fish? Yes, you uh, do need a fishing license in, uh, for for the state of Alaska. So they, the fishing license vary in cost depending on whether you want to buy it for a whole year, whether you're a resident, whether you're a non-resident, whether you want to buy it for just a week or two weeks, something like that. But you do need a fishing license and you can get those at Brooks Lodge. So that's one of the services they do offer. If you're coming uh, and you want to, want to fish at Brooks Camp, you don't have a fishing license with you, you can purchase it at, at Brooks Lodge. Okay, and we'll try to get to, uh, let's see. Another question here about um, about bear spray. Are visitors required to carry bear spray? 
Uh, they are not required to carry bear spray. In fact, it's really hard to get bear spray to Brooks Camp because you can't fly with it. it, it it's hazardous material. So uh, if you were to try to take it from, let's say, for example, from Anchorage, you're not going to be able to take it on any of the planes that are getting, going to get you to King Salmon. So it can be really difficult uh, to get bear spray to Brooks Camp, and it's not sold at Brooks Camp. Uh, so you're not required to carry it. Probably the best thing that you can do while you're at Brooks Camp is uh, hiking groups remain alert of your surroundings and talk to people that you're with as you're walking down the trail. Usually if you do those three things, you're alert of your surroundings, you hike in groups, especially groups of four or more. And you, uh, what was the last one, Gene? Did I say? <laughs> I'm sorry. I forgot the last one. Hike in groups, um, be alert of your surroundings. Uh, and yeah, and talk to one another as you're going down the trail. Those are usually the best things that you can, you can do to avoid close encounters with bears. The bears at Brooks Camp are usually very tolerant of the close proximity of people. There are minimum distance requirements that you have to follow at Brooks Camp. Uh, but, you know, if you're, if you're giving bears space, and you're, especially if you're in a group, um, you're generally going to be very, very safe. This is um, Brooks Camp. For the number of people that visit and the number of bears, it's really kind of phenomenal um, that we have so few in injuries from bears. In fact, only three people in the whole entire history of Brooks Camp have been in injured by bears. So you're much more likely to, uh, I think, to uh, to die in a plane crash, honestly, coming out or, or die in a car wreck, you know, uh, before you get to Brooks Camp than you are anything else. So um, you don't have to worry about uh, bear spray while you're there. We do recommend that you talk to people as you're walking down the trail. Make some noise to alert bears of your presence. Um, and uh, Jennifer Casey, um, has a question up and um, sorry, I'm not going to be able to pronounce your name on Nagayan um, has a question about backpacking and, and backcountry opportunities it's still in the queue. So I'll try to get those as, as soon as I can. Uh, maybe we'll get to the cabins next uh, because that's uh, the next thing that I had in my uh, keynote presentation here. So let me get back to that. I'm going to share my screen with everybody. Once again, and get back to the keynote presentation. Okay, so we covered the campground. Talk a little bit about Brooks Lodge. Brooks Lodge uh, has 60 beds. So each each cabin, each room, I think they have accommodates up to four people. Uh, and they're, they're bunk beds. They're not, they're not, you're not gonna find king beds um, at Brooks Lodge. So they're, they're small small cabins that you get to stay in, but each each room at Brooks Lodge has its own private bathroom. And they're located in some pretty fantastic spots. They're located right on the edge of the lake or right on the edge of the river. Sometimes your, your bear watching opportunities can be right outside your door, depending on you know which cabin you happen to be at, whether or not you're paying attention. So uh, the, yeah, at Brooks Lodge, uh, the cabins, I think, run around... $300 per person per night. And we can find that information maybe more specifically by going to catmyland.com. This is where also you can uh, find contact information if you wanted to book uh, a seat fare from King Salmon uh, to Brooks Camp. So they they have air services, of course, and Catmyland is an official concessioner with, uh, with Katmai National Park. So they do run Brooks Lodge. And their website has information about um, their different packages. Um, so you can browse those. They, um, yeah, I think during past years, they've run the a room in the lodge, um, runs about $300 per person per night. Um, but that can vary from year to year, too. Brooks Lodge also, um, we'll check out their rates here and see. So three night packages, you can see their prices here. It's not cheap. Uh, the campground, I forgot to mention, only costs $12 per person per night. So uh, depends on whether or not you want to camp, whether or not you're dead set on staying inside. Uh, demand for Brooks Lodge is also very, very high. Sometimes they can book up a year and a half in, in advance. So uh, you'll have to call them and see what their availability is. But they offer, uh, of course, um, guiding services for sport fishing or um, you know, heading out into the lake, uh, fishing rentals and equipment. Uh, they also have uh, meals as well. 
So if you wanted to stay at the campground and you didn't want to cook, but you want to eat at Brooks Lodge, they offer breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's sort of a buffet style, sort of a family style meal. And I think that last year their, um, their meals varied from about 20 to $40, depending on whether or not it was breakfast, lunch, or dinner. That's just a, um, a little bit about um, Brooks Lodge here. So Jennifer, I think I, I hope I could point you to the right direction about um, where um, right, you know how much do the cabins at Brooks Lodge cost. Um, so that uh, is definitely something you're going to want to ask um, Cat My Land specifically. Um, yeah, and again, usually around three hundred dollars per person per night. So um, yeah, again about our um, backpacking and uh, backcountry opportunities, uh, we're going to maybe talk about some of the other things that you can do at Brooks Camp, because there's a lot to do that isn't necessarily uh, just bear watching. There's a, a whole lot of other things that you can do here. So I'll try to uh, answer that question concurrently when, with what I'm talking about with um, some of our other um, activities at, at Brooks Camp here. So Brooks Camp is um, a really amazing place. Katmai is just a spectacular place altogether. So it may be worth some time to try to get out and explore some of these other places. In and around Brooks Camp itself, uh, fishing is really popular on the Brooks River. Uh, that's probably, probably the second most popular activity besides bear watching in Katmai National Park. A lot of people come to Katmai to watch bears and lesser numbers of people come to fish. Um, this area, the Alaska Peninsula especially, is really wor world renowned for its sport fishing opportunities. And none of the fish in Katmai are stocked. None of them are farmed. These are all wild fish. So when you end up catching a 25 inch rainbow trout, that's a trout that grew up here. It was born here, it grew up here. It's been getting fat on salmon eggs for a long, long time. So the fishing opportunities here can really be amazing. Hiking Mountain is one of those things that you can do as a, a day trip from uh, Brooks Camp. And there's a trail that goes through a pretty thick forest up to the top of Dumpling Mountain. You get a really great view about a mile and a half in of the Brooks River itself. And then you can get up into some of the Alpine territory. And from there, uh, you know, you're, I guess you're kind of only limited by how far you want to go. Uh, there's no restrictions on where you can travel by foot in Katmai, except around Brooks Falls. That area is closed to people uh, from June 15th to August 15th uh, currently. Uh, so you can't go um, into the area around Brooks Falls. And if you have more questions about that specifically, um, you can call the park and I'll be happy to um, give you the specifics of that. But the rest of the park is pretty much wide open for you to go anywhere that you please. Um, so again, 4 million acres, most of it designated wilderness, most of it lacking any roads. Uh, Dumpling Mountain is a really great place to go and explore during a day trip. I like to go up there to look for um, different types of birds. I like to go up there to look for wildflowers um, and just to relax uh, sometimes. Um, it's, it's just a, a very beautiful mountain and it's easily accessible from Brooks Camp. A few other things that you can happen to do while you're there are uh, some of our ranger-led programs. We have a walk that talks about the cultural history of the Brooks River area. And you, we don't often realize it when we're there, but when you're walking along the Brooks River, you're walking in a place that people have been using for nearly 5,000 years. So there's a lot of human history associated, associated with the Brooks River and our cultural walk starts every day during the summer at 2 p.m. And that's about a one hour program talking about the human history of the Brooks River area. And we take you to a reconstructed uh, semi-subterranean house that people would have used in this area about seven or 800 years ago. So that's something that you can uh, do with us. We also have evening programs every night at eight o'clock. So if you wanna join us for those, we talk about the major um, topics that make Katmai a special place, bears, salmon, human history, volcanoes, um, and you know some other things as well too. But you're welcome to join us for that. If you wanna get out of, the, uh, out of the weather, get away from the insects, you can join us in our auditorium every night at 8 p.m. Probably our signature uh, ranger-led program happens to be the Valley of 10,000 Smokes Tour. And that's an all-day tour. You purchase tickets for that through Brooks Lodge. It leaves Brooks Camp at 9 a.m. and usually doesn't get back until around 4 p.m. And the Valley of 10,000 Smokes is really an amazing landscape on the face of the earth. Uh, it's probably unique on the face of the earth, too. Nowhere on earth 
within modern times has an area been covered by so much ash. To make a long story short, on June 6, 1912, Novarupta volcano erupted and the eruption lasted for three days. And during the eruption, pyroclastic flows, hot avalanches of, of gas and ash covered uh, uh, the Yukak River Valley with, uh, with, in some places, hundreds of feet of ash. So you can take the Valley of 10,000 Smokes tour. It's a bus tour. Um, the, uh, there's a ranger that accompanies you. Uh, you can uh, visit the visitor center out there. But I think really the highlight of that tour is hiking down in the afternoon to the valley itself and getting to see the ash flow up close and personal. See where the rivers have carved down through it. Um, get to see the, the, the depth of ash uh, at uh, along the Yukak River itself, get to uh, sit next to the really violent waterfalls and gorges that you can find in the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. It is really a spectacular place. And when we talk about backcountry opportunities in Katmai, there are many, but I think a must-see destination if you are coming to Katmai and you want to experience a really unique environment, do some backpacking in the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. I, I try to do it several times a summer. I can't get enough of it. It's, it's really an amazing landscape. It's one of the easier places actually to hike too, not necessarily because of the weather, but because you don't have to bushwhack nearly as much as in other places. The vegetation in other places in Katmai can be really, really thick and that can really hinder uh, your pace as you're traveling um, cross country. But in the Valley of 10,000 Smokes, as long as the wind isn't blowing um, ash and dust in your air or, or in, the, in the air and in your eyes, you can travel across the valley um, fairly quickly. And it is really an amazing place. So if, again, if that was, um, that's probably the one place I would recommend trying to maybe take a backcountry trip if you wanted to extend your experience in Katmai. Another activity that you can do too, if you wanted to not maybe hike into the Valley of 10,000 Smokes, but you still wanted to see our volcanoes up close and personal, you can do some flight seeing as well. And there are many air taxis in King Salmon and some of the towns uh, surrounding Katmai National Park that offer these flight seeing services. So if you wanted to see some of the volcanoes like Mount Martin, which is shown here, you can definitely do that. And if you wanted to, uh, you know, see the, the Mount Katmai Caldera, which which was formed during that um, eruption in June of 1912, uh, you know, you can't climb there. Well, you can you can take a, an air taxi there if the weather permits. So that's another opportunity. Uh, seeing the park from the air is is also a really amazing experience too. Um, and that may be worthwhile for, for the folks who um, you know, aren't energetic uh, enough to, to hike to these places, don't have time, or, or whatever you know, hinders you. Um, if you can't you know, make it to these places on foot, then you can definitely take a plane to see them. So um, before we get to some of the final considerations about Brooks Camp here, before I kind of wrap up the Hangout, um, let me uh, check and see if there are any new questions. We got a um, a couple here. So, I did answer the one, um, you know, just a, a couple minutes ago about back backpacking and backcountry opportunities. Um, so, if you're um, still watching, thanks for uh, being patient and and uh, waiting for me to answer that question. Uh, let's see, uh, kind of a question from from Jane here uh, about guns. Are, are guns permitted in the park? And guns are permitted in the park uh, across. They're not, they're not permitted in buildings, however, uh, but you can bring a gun to Katmai. To, to be honest with you though, it's, it's probably not necessary, especially coming to Brooks Camp. Um, again, uh, at Brooks Camp, there are some things that you can do to really reduce your chances of having a, you know, a scary close encounter with bears. When you come to Brooks Camp, it's quite likely you're gonna have close encounters with bears, but you can really avoid those close encounters by, um, you know, again, hiking in groups, uh, talking to the people that you're with to warn bears of your approach and uh, and being alert of your surroundings. So those are the three things that you want to do uh, here. But if you feel it's necessary to bring a firearm with you, you can definitely do so. Um, so that is permitted within um, under uh, federal law right now. So And that happens to go with, for other national parks as well. It, it just depends on the applicable state law. So if state law allows you to, to carry uh, weapons um, in parks, then, then you can do so. But you're going to have to check uh, locally for 
you know, what other states do happen to allow. But in Alaska, you're permitted to bring um, a firearm into Katmai if you feel uh, the need to do so. Um, and uh, another question here uh, from a bear lover, bear lover that I'll, I'll try to answer. Um, if any of the rangers uh, or NPS employees have a day off while they are there, are we allowed to hire them to be our guide for doing other things at Brooks, like hiking or overnight into the Valley of 10,000 Spokes? Uh, no, you're not. So that would, uh, that would violate uh, the National Park Service uh, ethical uh, rules that we have. So we wouldn't be able to provide, uh, you know, you wouldn't be able to say, hey, I want Ranger Mike to take me to the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. Um, I wouldn't be able to be, um, go out there with you as, as a paid guide. Um, so you wouldn't be able to hire uh, National Park Service employees, but you would be able to hire guides um, that, are, that are not um, park employees. Um, so if they work for Brooks Lodge, for instance, those are not employed by the Park Service. They're employed um, by Katmai Land, which is, of course, a private company, uh, or some of the other commercial services within the park, you can, you can certainly do so. But yeah, sorry, I won't, I won't be able to, to guide you out to the Valley of 10,000 Smokes or, or do some bear watching. There are a few other um, extra um, considerations that I wanted to go over before I wrapped up the, the Hangout. Uh, again, if there's any last minute questions, um, I'll be trying to, to get to those um, before, um, before I'm done for the day. But I'm gonna share my screen with you, I think one more time here, and talk about maybe some of the final considerations that you can uh, put in the back of your mind before you happen to, to come to Brooks Camp. So again, I have to share my screen with everybody. To infinity and beyond. And get to our other considerations here. So there was a question earlier about whether you should bring a head net. And I wanted to put this slide in. It's not a very good picture, but I wanted to put it in to remind myself to tell you to bring a head net. You can purchase them at Brooks Lodge if you really forgot them, uh, but you know, bring bring a head net along with you. Uh, it's, it's hard to really see in this in this photo. However, uh, the the biting insects can be quite bothersome to people at times. Many people have different tolerances for biting insects. Some can't stand a single mosquito buzzing around their their ear. Other people, um, you can tolerate, you know, much much greater um, uh, numbers of of biting insects. But I definitely would recommend uh, bringing a head net along with you. And it's just not mosquitoes. Again, it can be black flies. It can be noceums. I'd also recommend bringing uh, long sleeve clothing as well. So long sleeve clothing is, is something that you're going to want to bring uh, to protect yourselves from biting insects. Insect repellent can work. It doesn't always work. What works better is just covering yourself up. So if the insects get really bad, put a head net on. Uh, put long sleeves on. And that I think is probably the best way to protect yourself uh, from Alaska's, um, you know, biting hordes. One other thing um, to talk about is what you should expect when you arrive at Brooks Camp itself. You're coming in July, you can expect to maybe see other planes on the beach. You're not gonna be the only one there. Coming in early June or in the middle of August, there's probably not gonna be as many planes or as many people that are gonna be around. But anytime that you happen to arrive, there's the, the distinct possibility that maybe a bear is gonna prevent you from getting off of your plane. Because bears do use the water right in front of the beach um, at Brooks Lodge, right in front of the Brooks Camp Visitor Center. And rangers are around camp all day trying to monitor where the bears are, trying to make sure that they have space to move around. But they may delay um, your travels here and there sometimes getting off of the plane if they're too close. But really the first thing that you do when you get off of the plane is that you're uh, whisked into the Brooks Camp Visitor Center for a bear safety orientation. And this is a short program that we give to each and every person who happens to arrive and you must get it upon arrival. And we talk to everybody just to lay down um, the, the situations or talk about the situations you may encounter and also tell you the rules and regulations that you need to follow so you can have a safe and enjoyable experience while you're at Brooks Camp. So 20 minute uh, bear safety orientation, talking about what uh, the special things that we need everyone to follow at the, at the, at the park. And one that I think everyone should be aware of before you happen to arrive is what you can do with your food and where you can eat it. Because you can only eat your food in designated places at Brooks Camp. There are designated picnic areas. Um, one's the campground, 
One happens to be the picnic area right outside of the visitor center, which is in this photograph here. And there's another picnic area up near uh, Lake Brooks as well. You can eat inside of buildings, but you can't eat anywhere else. Um, and this is to reduce really any temptations bears have to start associating people with food because right now they don't associate us with food. And that's a big advantage that we have here at Brooks Camp that you don't find in some other national parks. You can go to Yosemite, for instance, you can go to other national parks and you can find bears that are actively seeking food from people. We don't have that problem. And that's one of the most important, if not the most important thing you can do for your own safety and everyone else's safety is to make sure bears don't, assert, don't start associating us with food. So you can only eat your food in certain places and when you're not eating it or preparing it, you must store it in the designated food caches at Brooks Camp. So you can't carry your candy bars to Brooks Falls you must store them properly and only eat them in certain areas. So that's an important consideration. One other thing, um, this is kind of like a, a tip that has been floating in the back of my mind as well, is to make sure that you're looking around all the time too. Sometimes at, like up at Brooks Falls, for instance, we get very focused on the bear that's on the lip of the falls and we happen to miss the cubs that are right underneath us. So look around all over the place. You never really know where you're gonna see those bears, where you're gonna see those really exciting or novel behaviors. And like I mentioned before too, do expect um, a crowded view wildlife viewing platform at Brooks Falls in July. Anytime that you happen to go really from late June, maybe until early August, uh, up at Brooks Falls, you can expect um, crowding issues up there. And also expect to find bears anywhere. It's really true when we say there is no bear free area at Brooks Camp except in a building or on the wildlife viewing platform. It, again, it, it kind of becomes ordinary to me over a period of time, but the, you share the roads with the bears, you share the trails with the bears. Uh, you have to be aware of your surroundings, no matter where you happen to be, be prepared to step off of the trails, for instance, to let a bear pass, because the bears do use each and every place at Brooks Camp. Rangers and, and biologists around the camp will um, prevent you from going places if bears are too close. So. Do expect some delays getting to and from where you want to go if there are bears in the way. So if you might want to budget a little bit of extra lead time to get to uh, certain destinations, especially if you're looking to um, cross the bridge, for instance. There's a bear sleeping on the road. There's a bear sleeping near the bridge. There's a bear fishing in the water near the bridge. You might not be able to cross it. Really, the only way besides waiting across the Brooks River, the only way to get across the Brooks River is by crossing the floating bridge. And when bears are too close to it, we close the bridge. Not only for the obvious safety reasons, because they can get on the bridge if they want to. It's very easy for them to do so. But we also want to make sure that the bears have, again, space to go about their business with as little interference from people as possible. Uh, because bears can be displaced from the river, be displaced from their food resources if there are too many people approaching them or people just in the vicinity. So we want to make sure that we're giving bears the opportunity to have free access to the food resources that they need to survive. So do expect delays going back and forth across our floating bridge, depending on where the bears are and what they happen to be doing. Same thing goes with the beach too. We want to give bears uh, free access um, to the beach itself. And even at Brooks Lodge, sometimes bears climb trees near the lodge like this yearling cub did last year. And you might not be able to go to the bathroom, for instance, because uh, it's hard to see in this photograph. Um, the cub is in that blue circle, but it was right next to the lodge bathrooms. So people had to wait or, you, um, or they had to go to an, um, the restroom near the visitor center um, because we can't let people go near, near that cub until it's out of the tree and, and out of the way. So those are just some of the some other considerations um, that I wanted to cover and make sure that I got in before I conclude um, the hangout today. I'm going to um, check and see if there are any more um, questions. And I think there might be um, just a few in here and I'll try to um, cover those really quickly before I call it a night. Um, So yes, uh, thanks Bear Lover, Bear Lover for um, your comment. Yeah, uh, Merry Christmas to you as well. Um, and uh, is, the, is the Hangout recorded? Um, yes, uh, in fact, once I stop broadcasting, it should be immediately available on Katmai's YouTube channel. 
Uh, so if you're watching um, on Google+, Plus, uh, you know, you can go to, to Katmai's page on Google+, and then you can find uh, the link to YouTube right there for Katmai's YouTube channel. So you should be able to rewatch re this anytime that you want. Uh, let's see. And uh, one question from Stephen here. Uh, what can we expect weather-wise when we're there in September? And, and, and Stephen, I think when you visited in the past, um, you were here in, I think, late late July, early August, um, if I remember correctly. Uh, in September, you can expect uh, slightly cool, cooler conditions and probably slightly wetter conditions. Snow can be on the mountains by early, early September. You know, usually we don't see snow at, um, at the elevation that Brooks, Brooks Camp is at until, um, until later in the year, but you never know. Um, frosty conditions at night at Brooks Camp by September. We can, and maybe there's even a frost in, in, in July too. Uh, but yeah, generally frosty conditions start to hit by, by um, the, the middle of, of September itself. And September, August and September and October tend to be wetter months, maybe than July. Uh, so definitely bring some good rain gear with you. Uh, before I forget, too, make sure that you bring a pair of binoculars along with you, too. That's something that I would never come to Brooks Camp without. If you want to watch wildlife, bring a pair of binoculars with you. They open up a whole world of, of wildlife viewing opportunities for me. I can watch the fish in detail from the wildlife viewing platforms. I can watch insects. I can watch birds. And I can watch the bears, and I can see really some interesting details. Um, of their lives by looking at them through binoculars. So definitely bring binoculars. Uh, sorry, that's I have to digress and get back to Stephen's question. Uh, but yeah, weather-wise in September, expect cooler and wetter wetter conditions. One one also important consideration too for September is that it gets dark at night. Uh, the sun by the middle of September is setting by uh, you know around 8:30 p.m. or so. So you're going to want to bring flashlights and you're going to you want to plan to be in the campground or in probably your your cabin by 9 p.m. because it's dark and there's a lot of bears. And at nighttime, bears have the advantage. They see better than us, they smell better than us. So you don't want to um, surprise a bear at night. Um, and I'm in September, I'm in my cabin when, it, when it's dark. I don't like to wander outside. So in September, definitely um, bring, a, bring a, a flashlight or a headlamp with, along with you. Um, and I see some other comments in, in the questions here about um, thanking me for, for, the, for the hangout today. Uh, you know, I'd like to thank everyone for, for watching. Um, I hope you find this useful. If you um, have more questions about um, Brooks Camp, about, you know, trip planning, please visit Katmai's website. Uh, and again, that's uh, www.nps.gov slash K-A-T-M. And... We have a lot of trip planning information on there. You can find contact information for the park on there as well, too. And we'll do our best to try to answer the questions that you have because we want you to have a really good experience. So um, I appreciate everybody watching with me today. And if you um, have more questions, try to try to get a hold of me at some other point in time, and I'll do my best to, to answer those for you. Uh, but I think it's about time for me to, to call it a night. So enjoy. Um, Enjoy the bear cams, um, and, and thanks for watching, everybody, and I'll talk to you later.